tonight on Nation and Nation. High hopes for the High Court? With a seat on the bench coming up for grabs, what are the odds an Indigenous candidate could be appointed? Uh, it's hard to get into this question uh, without some skepticism. And my hope is that they're given, uh, their knowledge in Indigenous law is given significant weight. Senator Kim Pate says the Liberal government is at a critical crossroads when it comes to the over-incarceration and wrongful imprisonment of Indigenous women. If the government doesn't act, then I think all of us can legitimately say, why are you even pretending that you are concerned about these issues? The country's two Indigenous departments are spending more, but accomplishing less. What's behind the poor performance? The Parliamentary Budget Officer explains. Targets are imposed not by outside forces, but by the departments themselves, and they cannot meet their own targets, which is surprising. Hello, I'm Brett Forster, and this is Nation to Nation. For 50 years, the Canadian Supreme Court has made some major leaps on Indigenous rights. From the 1973 Calder decision that confirmed the existence of Aboriginal title to the 2014 Chilcotin decision that granted title to that BC nation, the court has been forced to act when governments refuse, but it still never had an Indigenous judge. With a seat on the bench set to open up soon, there is speculation that could change. Drew Lafon is the president of the Indigenous Bar Association. He joins me from Muskeg Lake, Cree Nation. Hello, Mr. Lafond. Hello, Brett. Don't say. An advisory panel that will identify candidates was announced this week. Two of its members are First Nations people. What would you like to see out of this process? So I think what we have to do when we talk about process um, and what the Indigenous Bar Association expects from the process uh, that's used to appoint judges to the Supreme Court of Canada is process is only one small uh, problem uh, with the lack of representation on the Supreme Court of Canada. And I think one of the biggest problems is uh, structural, uh, very, uh, very structural, rigid, systemic or cultural barriers uh, to the Supreme Court, which have prevented Indigenous peoples from sitting on that court. Uh, now, when we do talk about things that uh, within the process that we can improve, those are obviously uh, things that uh, we would like to see. Uh, but from a from the Indigenous Bar Association standpoint, there are much bigger fish to fry within the overall justice system. But um, when it does come to process, I think you had just mentioned it, the Independent Advisory Board, which was struck in 2016 by Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, does uh, make an effort to have representation from a variety of uh, a good cross section of legal representatives across the country. And up until very recently, um, there was very little Indigenous representation on that board. Now we're the Indigenous Bar Association, of course, is happy that uh, we were given the, the opportunity to nominate an individual uh, to serve on that board uh, to vet candidates to the Supreme Court of Canada this time around. Mm -hmm. And why hasn't there been more Indigenous representation, both within the advisory board, but obviously on the court itself? In other words, what are the barriers and other factors preventing this appointment, which you mentioned just now? Set up, and we all know that uh, the court being the highest court in Canada's judiciary right now, and up until 1949, um, we had a previous judiciary that was responsible for uh, it was the la it was the court of last resort and last appeals would uh, be heard by the judicial uh, committee of the Privy Council. Um, the court, the Supreme Court of Canada, I think, took on an extraordinarily important role in 1949 when it assumed the role um, of being essentially our court of last resort in Canada. 1982 comes along and the Constitution is uh, adopted by Canada and that really elevated or heightened the importance of the Supreme Court of Canada. It suddenly became uh, the final arbiter of charter and indigenous rights in Canada because the charter came into effect. Um, and shortly thereafter, uh, Section 35 of the Constitution Act became uh, part of the central concerns of constitutional uh, lawyers in Canada. And these are decisions which have an impact on our fundamental rights. And of course, the, the Supreme Court of Canada being the central institution, the head of one of the three branches of the federal government uh, has a responsibility to make sure that the perspectives and that the legal orders uh, that founded Canada are woven into Canada's legal fabric. Now, in order to do that, you have to make sure uh, that a couple things are in place. And like I mentioned, structural changes need to be in place. And I think 
The lack of any Indigenous representation on the court is only symptomatic of larger structural issues because... Uh, and what are, those, by... what are some of those structural <clears throat> issues? For example, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is requiring these judges to be bilingual in English and French. Is that a little bit of what you're suggesting? Well, and again, when we look at the structural issues, uh, we'll look at the current composition of the court, which is prescribed by the Supreme Court Act. Now, that's a quasi-constitutional document. That forms part of our constitution. The Nadon reference was abundantly clear to that point. Now, the composition of the court right now, um, as set out in that Supreme Court Act, requires that nine judges be appointed, three of whom must be from the Superior or Court of Appeal in Quebec. Um, and then the rest of the judges, the, the six judges are essentially subject to I mean, fairly broad, uh, but easy to satisfy eligibility criteria from a legal perspective. You have to be a member of a bar of a province uh, practicing for 10 years, um, or you have to be serving on a superior court of a province uh, in order to be eligible. Yet for some reason, um, we have not, as a result of the, like, uh, the eligibility criteria seems to be wide open, but for some reason, we have not been able to see Indigenous judges appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada. And in order to get to the bottom of that, you have to look at the much deeper structural, systemic, and cultural issues. Um, and when we see things, I don't want to say that the, uh, the official languages uh, or the bilingualism requirement is a structural issue, uh, only because I don't think it's a requirement at all. Much it's like when we talk about, exactly, when we talk about uh, regional representation or the convention of regional representation on the court, again, I don't see that as being a barrier for Indigenous, a structural barrier for Indigenous people because I don't see it being a requirement either. That's okay. built into well, our constitution. Well, given all, given all that, uh, what are the yeah. odds that the next top court judge will actually be an Indigenous person? Now, I, it's almost impossible to ascertain when you're looking at Canada's legal system whether somebody is going to be appointed. When you look at the history of the court, one would make the argument that it's extraordinarily unlikely that somebody is going to be appointed in the near future. Um, Indigenous peoples occupy all, all levels of government, all levels of the judiciary, and all levels of the legal system. Um, Indigenous peoples have traditionally played a fundamental role in designing their own Indigenous laws, yet for 147 years we still haven't seen an, an Indigenous judge appointed to the court. Now, um, in terms of qualified candidates to the bench, I can speak to, a, <laughs> there is a plethora of qualified candidates who I think uh, would be eligible to serve on the bench, who would meet not only the structural or constitutional requirements, but also the regional requirements. Um, and those individuals are people who are putting their name forward now, uh, many of whom have decided not to this particular go around. My hope is that those people, uh, that the Independent Advisory Board, that the Governor and Council, that Justice Minister Lametti gives serious consideration to those Indigenous candidates who uh, apply for the position. And, and my hope is that they're given, uh, their knowledge in Indigenous law is given significant weight. Um, their backgrounds uh, and their uh, their pedigrees are given the uh, the credence that they deserve, but I, it's hard to avoid. Uh, it's hard to get into this question uh, without some skepticism. Okay, Mr. Lafond, we have to leave it there. Unfortunately, however, I want to thank you for your insight. Thank you very much, Brett. After the break, Senator Kim Pate joins me to discuss how the justice system dispenses anything but justice for Indigenous women. Welcome back. A group of senators is calling on the Justice Department to reopen the cases of 12 Indigenous women who were wrongfully convicted or subject to miscarriages of justice. They released a report this week that describes the patterns of systemic inequality, discrimination and violence the women experienced prior to and throughout the criminal legal system. Independent Senator Kim Pate is one of three lawmakers now calling for the group's eventual exoneration. She joins me now for more. Hello, Senator Pate. Thank you very much. So first off, why did you pick these particular women and why do you think their cases should be reviewed? Sure. Well, the women are women I have known for a long time. Some of them as long as more than 40 years since they were children. 
and young people in the system. And uh, it's because I know the ways in which the build on of the discrimination, both in terms of racism, class, as well as uh, sexism or misogyny have really resulted in the miscarriages of justice we outline in the report. So may, all of them have experienced either first-hand or first or second generation residential schools, child welfare involvement, uh, physical and or sexual abuse, and many of them were responding to the situations they were in when they were criminalized. And so we've long talked about, and you know, the late Trish Montour was really the person who uh, put in writing the, the whole issue of what we call the hyper-responsabilization in particular of women and girls. And the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry focused on this, as did the TRC, as did the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry before it, and the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, which is this whole idea that um, the same issues that give rise to Indigenous women being more likely to be victimized, to be disappeared, to be murdered, are the same issues that result in them being on the street, living in economic deprivation, and ending up criminalized and imprisoned. You mentioned a number of reports there and something I wanted to follow up on. This uh, latest document comes after a fairly grim milestone. Indigenous women now make up 50% of the federal prison population. Does this report explain how we got to this point? It does, and it's partly why we're saying we need to look at these cases, but also there are others coming through the system. But really look at how every other system fails and failed these particular women, but also fails other women. And when every other system fails, the only system left that cannot refuse people is the criminal legal system. So it's not hard to criminalize someone if they're poor or if they're trying to survive on the street or if they're trying to negotiate, you know, past trauma of abuse, whether it's from residential schools or violence in their homes or sexual violence in other contexts. That, you know, those when people are reacting in with that with behavior that um, you know, may cause other people discomfort. Oftentimes prisons get used instead of ensuring that we have strategies for homelessness, that we have, issues, you know, things dealing with the trauma so that we don't have the resulting mental health issues. I mean, as we point out in this, in this, that a number of the women have been um, diagnosed with mental health issues because of the treatment in prison, one woman was diagnosed once she got into the mental health system as having isolation-induced schizophrenia because of all the time she was spent in segregation, solitary confinement, whatever name you want to use that continues on. And so it's really looking at how we continue to use that system because we don't insist that we have housing, clean water, adequate education, uh, broadband support, all of the issues that you and, and so many others have been raising uh, concerns about for so many years and that have been documented in many reports. Mm -hmm. The report does not talk much about uh, glad you factors in sentencing, but do you think if judges were weighing glad you a bit more heavily, this would result in fewer Indigenous women being incarcerated? Mm -hmm. Well, the char there's a chart at the beginning that shows that ever since all of these measures have been taken, all the reforms have actually resulted in, I think, in my humble opinion, system actors feeling uh, more at ease to put more Indigenous women in prison. And what I mean by that is we say, oh, we have programs in prisons, we have um, special circumstance courts, we have Indigenous uh, healing uh, centres. And so instead of questioning why are we even criminalizing these individuals to start with, it's, oh, well, at least they'll get some treatment or they'll get some support, even though there's no evidence that's actually happening. And all of the cases about the risk assessments, the biases within the system, the risk assessments, some of the examples we outline in the report reveal that that's not the case. You know, as you mentioned there, the governments have been alert to these issues for decades. Um, what if they continue not to act? Uh, what if this continues to worsen? Well, I, th I mean, there are already court cases being developed. Um, one of the things that uh, some of the women have applied to the, the current practice, the current approach. Uh, my hope is this may mean, you know, those, those cases will move faster than they might otherwise have moved. Uh, but really, you know, if the government doesn't act, then I think all of us can legitimately say, why are you even pretending 
that are concerned about these issues. And, you know, if you can, it, these are policy decisions. And if you're making policy decisions to continue to abandon people to the least effective, most restrictive, most punitive, and most damaging system, the criminal legal system, it's not a just system yet, so I don't call it a justice system, uh, then how can you pretend that you really are concerned about these issues? Okay, Senator Pate, we have to leave it there. I want to thank you for sharing your insight. Thank you very much, and thank you for all the incredible work you do. Thank you. Coming up after the break, the Parliamentary Budget Officer is here to discuss his latest report that finds the federal departments governing Indigenous people are still failing to meet their goals. Welcome back. Five years ago, the Federal Department of Indigenous Affairs was dissolved and split into the two we have today. Indigenous services alongside Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs were created to separate policy and negotiation from program and service delivery. But despite the restructuring and despite a whole lot more cash, the two departments are still failing to meet their goals. That's according to a new report from Canada's nonpartisan spending analyst. Yves Giroux is the Federal Parliamentary Budget Officer and he's here with me in studio. Mr. Giroux, welcome to Nation to Nation. Thank you very much for the invitation. So first off, uh, where exactly are these departments falling short and how? Well, they're falling short on keeping track of their own indicators. So departments, all departments, including CERNAC and ISC, Indigenous Services Canada, have to establish departmental results indicators, which are indicators to track their own progress towards attaining goals that they set for themselves, mostly. But what we found is that they don't do a very good job of, one, reaching these targets, and more importantly, keeping these targets consistent over time. So that what, that's what we, we found a bit surprising when we looked at the indicators that these departments set for themselves since they were created in 2017-18. And sometimes they have indicators, but they don't have dates by which they will attain these targets. So it's, it's a bit surprising to see that so few of these indicators are being met even after several years. Well, departmental results indicator sounds a little bit bureaucratic. Um, so what does this mean for regular people? Let's say for remote communities that rely on ISC for health care, for example. What does it mean for them? So, so it means that the department set itself target, for example, on the number of First Nations persons on reserve who assess themselves as in good health but the department is not able to meet that target. And that target is one example, but there are other targets where the government, the departments change the targets uh, over time. And it's a, it's a bit surprising that they will change a target and not meet it because it's targets that are imposed not by outside forces, but by the departments themselves. And they cannot meet their own targets, which is surprising. Uh, some targets are very well known, the number of long time uh, boiling uh, advisories for waters. Others are, are less well known. So there's in total 20 indicators for the Department of Crown Indigenous Relations. And I think it's for over 40. So it's 42 at the most recent count for Indigenous services. And they're meeting or, or there are results for about six to, to 10 of these in the case of ISC. So about a quarter or less of the, the results uh, are consistent with the targets the department set itself. And so based on all these numbers, based on all these shortfalls, is service delivery for Indigenous communities improving uh, or not? Well, it would seem that despite the amounts of money that are being invested in services, the targets that the department set for themselves, they're not being met. So it suggests that maybe services are improving, but it doesn't really show in the targets that both departments have, have established. So given that they're not meeting more, or reaching more of their own targets, services may be improving, but the indicators do not suggest that it's the case. 
Now, we haven't heard from the Liberal government uh, in terms of reaction from this just yet, but I expect when we do, they're probably going to look at this and point to the chaos of the restructuring combined with some of these historic one-time investments they've been making in things like legal settle settlements. So how did this study look at those issues and anticipate those arguments? Well, we looked at the post uh, post reorganization also we looked at pre reorganization so what it looked like before uh, CERNAC and ISC were created and the predecessors INAC in the Indigenous and Northern Affairs was the main service provider and we don't find any major differences mm -hmm. that being said it's quite possible that a major reorganization led to some some chaos chaos is too big of a world but but like some some changes mm -hmm. and, and some uncertainty with respect to the in the the indicators uh, one thing that's in the government's favor though is that they have increased the number of indicators especially on the indigenous services side mm -hmm. so that's a good thing because they have they are looking at more granular service or indicators which is a good thing which will allow to keep track of more specific uh, types of programs. Now the predecessor department here, Indigenous Affairs, formerly Aboriginal Affairs and formerly Indian Affairs, was always understaffed and underfunded. It was an open secret. So is this a matter of waiting for the bureaucracy to adjust to the new structure and the new funding levels, or is there cause for concern that the old patterns are repeating? Um, it's probably a case of the government having good intentions and investing significant amounts of money, but the plans that departments have are, are based on status quo spending or known levels of spending, and then the government, before or after the start of the fiscal year, makes provisions and tells the departments that they have additional resources. So it takes time to spend and massive or significant infusions of money and I think that's in good part the source of the issues with these two departments. They are provided with additional money but it's, uh, it's amounts that are significant but the departments cannot adjust that quickly to these um, additional investments. Now, on the other hand, the conservative critics for these two files have called this report damning, saying, quote, the liberals continue down their paternalistic path that spends more and achieves less. How accurate is that uh, in terms of a way to characterize the findings in this document? Well, uh, it's not my role to interfere in the politics of it, in the debates. So, but is it uh, consistent with the facts? Uh, that's one way of characterizing it. I think your listeners and people on the ground are probably in a much better position to determine whether it's consistent with the facts or not. Okay. And what are some ways the Liberal government can now start to remedy these shortfalls you've identified? So I think sticking to a set of indicators that the department would work towards as opposed to changing the indicators from one year to the other and also uh, being better at planning the amounts that will be invested and have a, a multi-year plan as opposed to having injections of money that the department is struggling to, to spend wisely. Okay, we'll look forward to see what happens. Mr. Giroux, thanks for your time. Thanks for coming in. It's been a pleasure. Well, that's it for us tonight on Nation to Nation. We'll be back next week with our season finale. Until then, I'm your host, Brett Forster. Have a great evening, and thanks for watching.